Good evening and welcome to E-Bible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 10 of Revelation chapter 7. And we're going to be reading Revelation 7 verses 9 through 12. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, or living creatures, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God for ever and ever. Amen. And I'll stop reading there. Uh, we were discussing this in our last study, or began to discuss this great multitude that was before the throne of God. And keep in mind that before the throne would be the footstool, and God speaks of earth as being his footstool. So it's very possible that the great multitude could be on earth and alive, living in the day of judgment, and still be in view as before the throne of God. And and we'll, we'll get into a further discussion of that later in this chapter. But for now, we see a great multitude from all the nations who stood before the throne. And we look at that word stood or stand, and we see that, that God is able to make people stand before him by bestowing grace upon them, by granting them salvation through the faith of the Lord Jesus, and that salvation clothes the sinner who in himself is spiritually filthy and and dirty and, and polluted, yet through the saving work of the Lord Jesus, the atonement that was accomplished on that sinner's behalf, they are washed with the baptism of the Holy Spirit as God cleanses away all sin and iniquity and sees it no more. They now are righteous before him, and that is pictured by being clothed with white robes. It typifies purity and holiness and that which is without sin. And they had palms in their hands. Now the palms we saw, there is a reference back in the Gospel of uh, John, the fourth gospel, in John 12, verse 13, when the Lord Jesus has his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and the people are crying out, Hosanna, and they also have palms in their hands. And Hosanna means, O oh, save or O oh, Savior. And that's uh, exactly the context here in Revelation 7 in the next verse, verse 10. And cried, this would be the great multitude that God has saved, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And the word N can also be un understood well, there, there's uh, not two gods. There is one God, and and of course, God uh, shows himself as three persons in the Bible, yet one God, and the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, is also eternal God. And to sit means God is now ruling over all of his kingdom. Uh, he is ruling over all of these people that have now become saved. They have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God's dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and they are crying out with a loud voice in recognition of this glorious occurrence that they have become saved. They have been delivered from 
their sins and, and the consequences of their sins, of dying, a second death, of being eternally destroyed. That will not happen to them. They have experienced God's mercy and his salvation. And so they are rejoicing and joyfully crying out to the one who has done this, the one seated upon the throne, salvation to our God. It is God's salvation plan. Salvation is of the Lord, the Bible says. It's not of man, as we read in John chapter 1, where it speaks of being born again. John 1, verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Salvation is of God. It is of the Lord. It is not performed by the will of man. God matter-of-factly, definitively, absolutely declares in John 1 verse 13 that no man is born again by his own will. He declares free will is another gospel here. He declares it is a lie. It is uh, an error. It, it is completely false for anyone to think they can exercise the will of man and, and the will of their own flesh and be born again. No, it is by the will of God and only the will of God. He will have mercy upon whom he will have mercy. So therefore salvation belongs to to God. It is of God. It was designed by him, implemented by him, carried out by him. All the works were finished by him from the foundation of the world as the Lord Jesus died for his people at that point. Some don't like to hear that. And, and, and I can't help but think that one of the reasons must be that that fact that the Bible declares in, in a straightforward way, that Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, that that fact so far removes the possibility of man doing any work whatsoever, of having any involvement of any kind with his salvation, that it's disturbing in a deeper level to some people. And even perhaps these people might say, oh, God does everything, but yet they're disturbed by this wonderful, beautiful truth that Christ did the work of salvation when man was not even yet created, which clearly would put a stamp of absolute um, verity upon that, that man could uh, have played no part or role in it whatsoever because he was not even there. Of the people, none were with me. We read in the book of Isaiah, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the Lamb now seated upon the throne. Salvation to our God is the cry of the great multitude that God has saved. And uh, we are that great multitude if we're a true believer, a true child of God, living at this point in time, living in the world in the day of judgment. We have come out of great tribulation, just as we'll find this great multitude is said to have came out of great tribulation. And therefore, we are in view with this beautiful picture of of all of God's elect singing praise or or declaring praise unto him. It goes on to say in verse 11 of Revelation chapter 7, And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four living creatures and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Now notice in verse 11 that everyone is falling 
down before the throne on their faces. They are prostrating themselves. They are bowing down. They are taking the posture of humility and and submitting themselves before God. That is what the posture, the action of bowing down points to. And, and, you know, the Bible says that anyone who bow downs in this kind of way is worshiping. Now, it may be very insincere worship. It may be superficial outward worship to just take the posture, to perform the act of bowing down, but God still calls it worship. Uh, For instance, in Matthew chapter 18, in verse... Uh, 26, it says, The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Now, in this parable, this individual owed his Lord a great debt, and in verse 27 says, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So he um, fell down and worshipped him, and said, Lord, have patience, I'll pay you all. And then the debt was forgiven. It would really seem that this is indicative of a true believer, a true child of God. Yet we find, not very long after, he's taking his fellow servant by the throat, demanding that a much smaller debt be repaid to him, that the fellow servant owes him. And this uh, same man who fell down and worshipped is later um, judged and his Lord is wroth with him and he's delivered to the tormentors till he should pay all that debt. And and therefore he was never saved uh, in, in this parable. He's a picture of someone never saved, never um, received a new heart. And yet he performed the act of, of falling down and worshiping. Now, in Mark 15, we read of some others that are taking the posture, but um, they're definitely not not worshiping. In uh, Mark 15, the Roman soldiers are mocking the Lord Jesus. And it says in verse 17, and they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it about his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, and put it put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Now, obviously, they were not bowing down to Christ in, in sincerity, they were not bowing to him as Lord and Master or, or as God and Savior. They, they were playing around. They were, they were uh, reviling and mocking him. And they were doing this because they thought he was just somebody who was usurping the, the Roman crown, making claims that he was a king. And Yet, of course, he was truly king of kings and lord of lords and worthy of all worship of all mankind, including those soldiers. As God has created men, he's created every human being, and therefore, as creator, God is due, he is due worship by his creatures. Now, man is created a creature that was designed to worship God. And and yet, when we fell into sin, that worship of God was perverted. It was ruined uh, because in order to worship God, we, uh, we must worship him in spirit and in truth, the Bible tells us. And let me read that. In John chapter 4, there's a a nice section here where God gets into true worship. In John 4, 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, 
and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see here how the Lord referred to true worshipers. Now we speak of true believers to distinguish um, a true believer from uh, a casual believer or a professed believer because there is a difference between a true believer, someone who God has made a true believer by by saving them, and, and they have a very different understanding of the Word of God and, and a very real relationship with Him, and, and therefore they're uh, in a different category of belief. They are true believers. Likewise, there is true worshipers and worshipers of God. Worshipers of God take upon themselves the posture. They perform the action of bowing down. And, and, and not to say that a true believer or true worshiper will not also perform the, the action. It's, it's um, very appropriate and good for a true worshiper of God to bow the knee, literally, to get down on his uh, knees or to uh, fall down to the ground, uh, to bow down beside his bed or her bed, and to pray to God. And, and actually, since God recognizes posture as an indicator of worship, it, it's very good for us to do. Even though a true worshiper can worship God standing up or sitting or in any other posture, uh, you know, God doesn't absolutely require everyone to bow down every time they want to worship him or pray to him or speak with him in prayer. But since the Bible lets us know that simply bowing the knee and, and lowering the head is a physical indicator of worship, well, there's nothing wrong with a believer doing that. And sometimes taking the physical posture may help us in preparing ourselves for worshiping God, as, as it is just simply a, an acknowledgement that we are coming before the Lord of glory. We are coming before King of kings and Lord of lords and the great God of heaven, and he is seated upon his glorious throne, and we are um, on earth his footstool, and therefore let us bow down. Well, but, but that's not the point. The point is that a true worshiper of God is one that will serve him and worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit, in the spirit of God, the true worshiper will have that spirit. We will have the uh, indwelling Holy Spirit. And, and, and therefore, God will receive our worship in a much different way than he views the worship of others that have not that spirit. And in truth, you know, we worship God when we believe the truths of the word of God, as the Lord Jesus Christ is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christ said in John 14, verse 6. And, and so we worship God in spirit and in truth. And, and both of those things identify with Christ and they identify with the word of God. God's word is spirit. The law is spirit. And, 
and uh, God's word is truth. Thy word is truth. And therefore, when we adhere and follow faithfully, as faithfully as we can, the teachings of the Bible, when we hold on to them, no matter what man says, regardless of what the world thinks or the pressures put to bear upon us by the church or or anyone else, by people in our family or neighbors, by society itself, because the Bible teaches something contrary than society teaches, or whatever the circumstance, if we are um, standing upon the Word of God and we're trusting the Word of God, and we will not um, turn from the course that the Word of God has set, but we will follow the direction of God's Word, then this is worship, and this is glorifying to God. And and the, the true believer, the true worshiper of God, is, is worshiping God in doing this. Well, let, let's uh, go back to Revelation chapter 7. And let's continue into verse 13 now. Oh, one, one thing about verse 12, um, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And there are seven um, attributes or seven praises mentioned here that are recognizing uh, a particular attribute of God and and glorifying him. And that points to the perfection of all these things and the perfection that God is blessing and his word is blessing and the glory of God and the wisdom and thanksgiving and so forth. Okay, in verse 13, it says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, and that would be referring to John. Remember, John is receiving this whole vision of the book of Revelation while he was on the island of Patmos. The Lord appeared to him to uh, give him this divine revelation. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Now, th- this is an interesting verse, and uh, an interesting statement, because one of the elders who answered saying this to John it is really um, a reference to Christ himself. If we were to look at this literally in the Greek, it's one out of the elders answered, saying unto me. Now, first of all, God himself could be considered an elder uh, because he is ancient of days. And since he is triune in nature, three persons but one God, he, he can be spoken of in the plural as elders. But I don't think it's referring to uh, the Godhead. I think it's referring to the 24 elders that we saw uh, earlier that were round about the throne and, and have been mentioned um, several times in the book of Revelation. The 24 elders, 12 uh, from the Old Testament, um, pointing to the 12 tribes of Israel and 12 from the New Testament, pointing to the apostles that were selected to, to be with Christ. And therefore, the 24 pointing to the completeness or fullness of all of God's elect that would be saved from Old Testament and New Testament. And who indwells these elders? Well, it is the Spirit of Christ. Christ is in the midst of the elders. Um, he, is, he is indwelling each child of God. We read back in in Revelation 5, in verses 5 and 6, it says, And one of the elders, and that's the same identical language in the Greek, and one out of the elders, saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, 
and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain. So you see there we find a reference to Jesus as the lamb that had been slain in the midst of the elders. And, and so one out of the elders, we read in Revelation 7, 13, and, it, and it's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? So the Lord Jesus is asking two questions to John. And of course, John doesn't know the answer. Uh, the, the one asking the question does know the answer. Christ knows the answer. And, and then that makes us wonder, then why is he asking the question or the, the two questions? And the only answer to that has to be that he wants to draw attention to the answer to these questions. He wants to emphasize this truth. He wants us to know exactly what the questions are asking. First of all, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? Now, that sounds awkward in the English. What are these? Because it's referring to people. And we, uh, we naturally want to, to change that to who are these or who are they? And that is actually um, permissible because the same word translated as what here is translated often as who, depending on the context. And since people are the ones being referred to, the great multitude clothed with white robes back in verse 9, it, it is more accurate and we should change this to who are these or who are they which are arrayed in white robes. And, and, of course, the Bible permits this, and it's much more understandable and uh, easy to our ears to hear the question asked that way. So that's the first question. Who are they which are arrayed in white robes? And the second question is, and whence came they? Whence is an old English word that we don't use too often in our modern day, and it means from where. From where came they? From where came they? Two very important questions. And the answer, especially to the second question, from whence came they, is um, going to help us very much in understanding something else in the Bible. As we read of those that, uh, that are knocking on the door in the day of judgment in some places, for instance, in Luke 13. And one of the things said to them is, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Actually, it's not put exactly that way. It is, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Isn't that interesting that God uses the very same word, whence ye are? Um, in Revelation 7, the, the question is, whence came they? Well, uh, we're out of time. The next time we get together, we'll, we'll pick this up and, and try to uh, answer some of these questions.